panelists for the Precision Farming from Hobes to Harvest webinar series. This project is brought to you by the UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soils team and is sponsored by the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. We have a great lineup of speakers joining us over the next couple of weeks from all over the country and also some local experts. And we'll be digging into a variety of topics, exploring technologies available to dairy producers. We're starting the series this week, hearing about some of the more cow side technologies and tools. And next week we'll move into um, some of those that are used in the field. You can use the same Zoom link that was provided to you when you registered to access all of the sessions. And all the sessions were, are being recorded and will be posted to the Northwest Crops and Soils Program website under the Conferences and Events tab. There are water quality and certified crop advisor credits available for each session. And we will share the link and QR code at the end of the session. We'll put up a slide for you. There will also be three poll questions throughout the presentation. If you could take a second to answer them when they pop up on your screen, we would appreciate it. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat and we will facilitate them when our speaker has concluded. Today, we are thrilled to have Kevin Jorgensen here to talk about genetic selection strategies for 2030 and beyond. Kevin joins us from Waupon, Wisconsin. He has served as the Senior Holstein Sire Analysis for Select Sires since 2014. His territory consists of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Western United States and Canada. Showcase selections and red and white coordination are also part of his responsibilities. He grew up on a registered Holstein dairy farm in Wisconsin and attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison and received a Bachelor's of Science in Dairy Science. And he later received an MBA from Marion University. Kevin has been in the AI industry and joined Select Sires in 1998 and spent the first 16 years at East Central Select Sires in Waupon, Wisconsin, working as a select mating service and select reproductive solutions evaluator, and later as the director of dairy programs. In addition to his duties at Select Sires, he owns 100 head of registered Holsteins with Mitch Brunig of Jenny Lou Holsteins in Salk City, Wisconsin, and works in the dairy cattle sale industry, working auctions across the U.S. as a pedigree announcer and ringman. Kevin also served six years as a member of the Wisconsin Holstein Association Board of Directors from 2012 to 2018 and served as president for 2017 and 2018. On behalf of Select Sires, Kevin also serves on the World Dairy Expo Board of Directors and is a member of the Executive Committee. Kevin resides in Waupon, Wisconsin. And Kevin, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can put yours up there and get started whenever you're ready. Let's see if this works. How's that, Amber? Can you see it? That looks good, Kevin. Okay, super. Well, good morning, everybody, and it's it's just really a, an honor and a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you today. And I want to thank Amber and, and everybody at the uh, Extension at Vermont. It's it's really a pleasure to be with you today to talk about uh, something that I spend <clears throat> most of my days with, and uh, and a couple of pieces of uh, where we're headed that uh, I've spent uh, the better part of part of my career working on in terms of uh, skating to the future and seeing what what will happen genetically. And, and I think it's an incredibly exciting time. Um, it's certainly the fastest moving in my nearly 30 years of, of uh, work here in the AI industry. So I just wanted to start this morning kind of giving a, a, a quick overview of where we are and, and it's where we've just in the last 15 years. So for those of you that are Gen Z, uh, you don't remember a time that, that there hasn't been genomic evaluations, uh, probably, because we're into 15 years now of, of genomic evaluations being published. The first one's being in 2009, and it may not be perfect, but I remember uh, daughter dam comparisons. I remember the animal model. I remember the progeny test. And I would tell you wholeheartedly that I think we're in a better spot today than we were previous to that. And I'll show some illustrations of that in a moment to, to confirm that. So as those first 
genomic predictions came out, animals being tested. In those first couple of years, there was probably a lot more males being tested than there was females uh, as we began to use it in sire selection as, as, a, as a screening tool. And so it took about six years to get to the first million genotypes recorded, both male and female. That happened in 2015. About that time, once we had a database that was bigger, then there were some abilities of our collaborators in the industry to look at new things. And in 2016, uh, Zoetis, uh, with the data and the collaborators that they had, came out with the first wellness traits, going to more metabolic diseases rather than some of the traditional evaluations that we saw. Uh, CDCB followed suit very shortly after that in 2018 and, and added new traits, uh, particularly mastitis, uh, RPs, DAs, those types of things that we're starting to do some analysis of as well and have a genetic evaluation. The five university trial was being conducted there through the 2010s. They completed their information uh, back in the late uh, teens that helped create the impetus for feed saved and, and feed efficiency evaluations. And that was introduced uh, already. It's amazing that it's already three years that we've had feed saved into the net merit evaluations. And then sort of like Moore's law as everything continues at a faster pace, from 2015 to 2023, we had 7 million more animals genotyped and we now sit with a milestone of last year of 2023 of 8 million genotypes recorded. Just amazing uh, uh, the, the amount of information that we've collected in, in these past uh, decade and a half. As you look at, so in my mind, I think that genomics is the biggest innovation in our industry since the frozen semen straw in 1953. Uh, it's been the internal combustion engine, I think, in terms of genetic progress. So this is just an illustration, and I'm using net merit as an example. You could use nearly every other trait that we measure for. As you take that baseline here in 2009, when those first evaluations came out, and then just see the meteoric rise and, and you can just see that trend line moving up so dramatically as we've uh, had the ability to select for genomics and able to increase the genetic profitability, efficiency of, of all breeds of cows. And I'm probably going to talk more Holstein today, but these are applicable, uh, particularly to jerseys for sure as well. So we've made some media progress. I think genetics are moving faster than ever. We've reduced the generation interval on both males and females. And I'll talk a little more about this in a moment. We've had not just genomic technology, but the ability to have uh, IVF technology, sex semen. It's, it's allowing for more offspring out of the most elite donors and, and the critical mass of those great donors and great calves is also pushing this genetic progress. It's allowed for a lot of producers to be far more precise in their breeding strategies of who they want to make their next generation of, of replacements from, who is going to be the, the dominant uh, uh, members of their herd to contribute in the future. And, and that precision uh, breeding technology, I think, has, has also helped to that meteoric rise. And then we're selecting, as I said a moment ago, for a far more traits, particularly in health and fitness, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've we've be, moved far beyond where we, where we were previously. So this equation, the genetic equation that goes back to Jay Lush in the 1930s of, of how do we measure genetic progress, it's genetic variation times selection accuracy times selection intensity divided by the generation interval. And all the things that I just mentioned in terms of what have happened, selection accuracy has gone up because of the genomic prediction. Intensity has gone up, and I'll touch on that in a moment. And we've lowered the generation interval dramatically. So that has changed all the variables. You'll see in the genetic variation, it says up and down. That becomes an open question uh, in terms of how much genetic variation that we do have. And that's maybe a topic for another seminar sometime down the road. But if you look at where we were 40 years ago, the amount of traits that we got, you know, using an example of the, probably the most influential bull in history in elevation, uh, we had about 12 linear traits, milk, fat, no protein, uh, a type score, and a TPI. And that's pretty much the information that we used to make genetic selection decisions, you know, pre uh, in, in the daughter dam comparison or early days of, of, of information. Fast forward now to today. And the same information that we get on any one calf today, 
we've got six production traits, 15 fitness traits, five type traits. And I'm not even sure I've got all of these there, but I know we do measure now 18 linear traits, the multitude of different selection, multi-trait selection indexes we have, the reliability. So we're dealing with over 70 different traits here today. And this is just in the US. And all of the information is in in terms of Canadian data, international indexes, there's just this plethora of information that we're sorting through today to make our breeding decisions. And I think, again, more data is a good thing, but it also can be daunting as well. So to give it, I mentioned a moment ago within that genetic equation, the selection pressure. And I just wanted to give an illustration of what that selection pressure looks like today. So in 2023, here at Select Sires, we tested 7,500 Holstein male bull calves in 2023. And you can see there are about 26,000 throughout the entire uh, in, a, industry here in the US. So we're about 30% of all those calves that were tested were here. Those 7,500 bulls that we tested were sired by 114 different sire fathers. So that's the diversity. That's what we're trying to search for is, is using a lot of different sire fathers. And that eventually ends up with about 250 bulls a year that we're going to send to the marketplace uh, within a particular year period here in 2024, those calves born in 2023. So when you think about that, that is a one in 30 selection pressure. Thank the people that want to make bulls for AI yet because it's bless their hearts because it's a it's a tough thing for someone to know that 29 out of 30 swings at the plate probably aren't going to result in success. But that is intensified the selection pressure so that we can truly bring in the very, very best of the population. And I think that that's one of the things that has moved that uh, trend line that I started with in such a dramatic fashion. Here at our shop, here at Select Sires, one of the mantras that we've had for the last several years is, is about longevity. Um, I'm going to touch on why this is important in a few moments and some other things. But we truly think that the cows need to, the longevity is, is good for a multitude of reasons. Number one, it's not just living longer. It's living healthier, more productive, uh, producing more product reducing carbon footprint, all of the things that we hear about on a daily basis that we're all faced with in terms of the world we live in today, that the cows that we do have are we're doing producing more with less is the mantra that I think we all have to live in. And so we have taken that to heart. And for the last several years, we've really, really tried to, to focus our attention on longevity. And I'm going to touch on that in a little more detail. This is my five minute plug and it and it ties into where we're at today in terms of most everything else I'll try to, to speak on today is more industry related, but specific to select sires in terms of multi-trade selection indexes, uh, we have built an internal index that we think not that we don't like any other index and I'll get to that in a moment. That's for you as dairy producers to decide which one best fits your needs. But as we look at the future and try to skate to 2030, we feel like maybe this is what the new indexes in the future will probably focus more attention on. So we really, uh, we came up with an index called Herd Health Profit Dollars, and we just are looking at things like mastitis resistance. I'm going to speak a lot of that today because I think it's maybe the next low-hanging fruit that's out there for, to make, for us to make dramatic improvements in the productivity of cows. We also want to continue to focus on fertility traits, and we thought maybe net merit isn't focusing on it enough, so we wanted to make sure that we had fertility in focus. We want to also, some of the other indexes maybe don't put uh, particularly DWP and net merit, not as much on confirmation traits. We wanted to find that, that happy medium of the very, very important uh, structural confirmation traits that, that truly are, are economically important. And then we also know that, the, and, then, and again, in this world of, of doing more with less, can we moderate body size? Can we improve on feed efficiency? And so, you know, we're skating to where we think the puck is headed in terms of uh, just a little different weighting. So in terms of why, and as you look at this, the, the two big differences in the index that we are uh, speaking to mostly these days in HHP, using and development and selection, is a higher emphasis on mastitis resistance than most of the other indexes. And I'm going to speak to some of those things and, and, and then the why in a few moments. And the other side is, as I said a moment ago, not as much emphasis, more emphasis on confirmation than maybe some of the merit indexes, not quite as much as there is in TPI. Uh, I do want to point out on this slide as well, 
I'm a, so I'm, I'm agnostic to any index. I am a believer that you as producers find the one that works best for you. Multi-trade selection indexes do a great job of helping screen bulls and move there. But ultimately you want, as a producer, should have the final say in which index makes it the best fit for you. But I do find it interesting that TPI gets bashed maybe more than it should when truly it has more fertility in it than any of the other indexes that are out there. And I think that's sometimes overlooked that that uh, there is a lot of fertility uh, built into, into TPI and certainly more than, than some of the merit indexes. So I think that was significant in that respect. So let's circle back to why this is all important and where we're skating to and where we're headed. And I think uh, with all of the innovations that have came through and I spoke of it at the, at the introduction, we are in a new paradigm in the universe, in the dairy industry, particularly here in the United States, of how many heifers are really in the population. If you look at this here, and this is uh, just came out uh, about the first of the year of uh, the new NAS cattle inventory numbers, and you look at where we are for 2024 in relationship to 2016, there are about a half a million less replacements in the population today than there was just six years ago. And I, you can argue whether there was too many in 2018 or too few in 2024, but where we're at today is there's a lot less replacements out there than there was, and this is the new normal. I think uh, 2025, I don't expect to be back at 2019 levels. Uh, where we are today, I'm not sure has hit the low point, but I know that we won't be over 3 million replacements again for a very, very long time, and maybe never. Um, because of the strategies and things that are going on in dairy producers' farms that just doesn't allow for that. And so with that being said, I truly think the cow population is changing. And this is why longevity and all these pieces of the puzzle need to be considered. Because I truly think the cow population is changing. And I have done this presentation a couple different uh, groups. And whether this is right or wrong, I, I liken where we're at today is similar to the China one child policy. It works till it doesn't. And uh, ironically, uh, they gave up on the China one child policy in 2015 and the population is still shrinking. And I think it's a little bit the same way in our dairy industry. That slide I just showed uh, because of the popularity of beef on dairy, I don't think the incentive is there to increase the population because there's some other financial incentives and, and for a multitude of reasons that are, that are happening. But when that happens, the population is gonna age, and I'm gonna to touch on that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another couple of slides. The other thing is what's interesting about all this and this changing cow population is the US dairy herd has really not changed very much over the course of the last year, year and a half. There's less cows going to slaughter, slaughter numbers, even with pretty favorable beef prices, you don't see uh, massive sell-offs, massive slaughter, because there aren't the replacements in the pipeline to replace the cows that are there. And that is affecting uh, how many cows are going to slaughter, but it's not necessarily changing the population of those 9.3, 9.4 million dairy cows in the population. So that slide I just showed a moment ago, that is the smallest heifer population since 2004. So 20 years, uh, we have not been this low on heifer population. And as I said a moment ago, beef on dairy has become just a very, very standard operating procedure on most dairies in terms of right size. And we're gonna to touch for the next few minutes about a lot of that that's occurring. So the next slide here, the reason I share this is, is as Amber said, I spent the first 15 years of my career uh, here in Southern Wisconsin, working with dairy farmers, doing mating recommendations. But in the early 2000s, I morphed into what I call a hybrid approach. And I was working primarily with larger dairies here in the state from, say, 400 to 3,000 cows. I, I had a very small group of herds that I worked with. They gave me a lot of really, really good data. And I was far more than just a, a genetic consultant. It was reproduction. It was general, uh, overall, big picture uh, type of consulting. And uh, part of that morphed with after I got my MBA. And so I spent a lot of time working with producers. And in 2010, uh, I wrote a couple of articles for Hordes Dairymen that I've got up here on the screen. And the first one was about this increase, because all of a sudden heifers were starting to increase in the population. And people were saying, man, there's, there's, there's just too many of them. It's all this sex semen. Well, realistically, it was a lot more than just sex semen. It was better transition housing. It was reproduction more than anything. And then, the, but the combination of all of them was increasing the population. My second article was about new ways to use extra heifers. 
And I, and I put this up here because this was 14 years ago when I wrote this and it says, should we breed dairy cows to beef? I want to say wholeheartedly, that was a radical statement in 2010, 11. And after this, these articles were produced, uh, I would be out on farm and I would see other consultants or dairy field men in the population. And they would say, are you that whack job that wrote about breeding dairy cows to beef? And it was, uh, you know, it was kind of controversial. And I did have a lot of herds at that time that I was consulting with that were beginning this deep beef on dairy proposition because they wanted to manage their, their heifer inventories. And so it's just funny that, and I did not in, not invent beef on dairy. I'm not implying that at all, but I was asking the question of my clients and it was radical just that at that time. And now we look at what beef on dairy has done and it has changed the game. And I think the combination that created this was precision breeding strategies, as I mentioned before. And it didn't just come from genomics and genomic testing, but it's certainly a big piece of it in terms of knowing who your best replacements were, how do they rank amongst your contemporaries. Probably more importantly that helped change this is, is improved repro performance. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people like Milo Wilbank and Paul Fricke and, and personally and, and all the folks that created a double off sync, G6G, all of those things really, really changed the, the game on top of in a, and in addition to detection systems. You know, the, the ability of our uh, the, 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 the technology companies, whichever one they are, and there's numerous ones that are out there today in terms of whether it's it's SCR, Cal Manager, NEDAP, there's a there's a there's a, just a plethora of those out there, and they have improved that repro performance dramatically. Uh, as I look at preg rates where they were in the middle 2000s when I started doing consulting and where we are today and what's considered acceptable today is, is uh, you know it's double than what it, what it was just the 15 20 years ago. And then adding in sex semen and I think the other side of the sex semen equation that maybe wasn't occurring in 2009 10 when I was talking about those articles because we were still in the first 5 or 6 years of sex semen was early in sex semen it was could you get product. And now it's just an expectation that the very best bulls in the industry are available in sex form and it's the number one question I get most days any new bull we release well is he sex there's almost an expectation that we want the very, very best genetics in the industry available in sex form. And the good news is because of the increase in the efficiencies and the technology advances within sorting that we now, no matter where you buy your, your product from, it's an expectation that you get the very best. And all of those things together, I think, have, have created a perfect storm in terms of producers really being able to be precise and have that precision breeding strategy I mentioned. The other side that has changed the beef on dairy side of it economically, let's face it, heifer raising is one of the biggest, single biggest costs on a dairy in terms of cash flow drag, net herd replacement cost, all of the things that come into play in terms of the expenses on a dairy. And since we've been through maybe the last golden age of extremely high milk prices was 2014, we're in, a, in an incredibly different spot in that. And then again, the other side that's driving this beef on dairy is that beef cattle numbers in and of themselves are at historic lows and there's a demand for those black calves. Did you have a question, Amber? Okay, okay. Just saw you uh, raise your hand there. So um, so I really think this this whole beef on dairy thing, um, you know, depending on who you talk to, my, my cattle partner calls it black crack because uh, the, the enticement for these high, high uh, black calf prices, at least in, in our neighborhood here in the Midwest, we're hearing upwards of $800 for these black calves right now. And that's the other reason I don't think that the, the, the population of dairy replacement females is going to change. The economics of it just say it's hard to get around if you're using it. Let's talk about some other things of why longevity is important and why we focus so much attention on this. The environment that our cows are living in is changing dramatically. Uh, I'm fairly certain that there are less cows every day living on sand bedding across the country um, for a multitude of reasons. And some of it is expansion, some of it's green energy, some of it is, is uh, accessibility. But the reality is, is cows are living in different environments. And when you live on separated solids, manure solids, 
Uh, there's more susceptibility to mastitis. That's where you're going to hear me continue to talk about mastitis resistance. They are more susceptible to injury because sand is a great surface for cows to walk on and, and have grit. And some of the expansions that have taken place here in the Midwest, that has been the biggest paradigm shift that they've explained to me is that injuries are more prevalent and they need to manage that way or they've added more rubber after they've put in a new facility because it's a different situation. There's certainly more cows are going to be milked with automation, particularly in robots, and that may be applicable up in your neck of the woods in Vermont, whether it's one or two robots in, 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 a, in a box situation or uh, the rotary side of things or, or uh, the, the box systems where there's 10 or 12 robots. But automation is certainly changing of the environment of cows. And the other side is, is rotary parlors are becoming much more the norm if people go to size and scale that they're using rotaries and, and that's a different environment as well. What this all adds up to, where I've gone so far with a smaller population um, and, and less replacements and cows living longer and needing to live longer for the reasons that uh, supply chains give you, is over the last 10 years, we've seen uh, what I call an empowering decision for dairy producers, which is they get to decide who stays and who goes. You could be pretty, the, you were, voluntary calls are the ones you decide don't need to be there anymore. And, or you've either got adequate replacements that this underperformer, maybe she just doesn't meet your needs. You can get rid of her. I think those dynamics are changing. I think there's going to be far more cows that are involuntaries and they're going to leave for some reasons we'll talk about in a moment that the cow is going to tell you when she needs to leave versus you're going to tell her when she can leave. And that's going to change in terms of some management decisions that I think are, are out there. And that's why genetically we need to be thinking about all these things. So one of the other things in one of the presentations I gave back last fall, I posed to a group of dairymen, I said, are you prepared to have a geriatric ward on your dairy? Uh, as your cows live longer and, and, and they're going to be older cows, um, that is a different management structure that you need to be thinking about. And maybe that's uh, not the right way to say it in terms of geriatric ward, but for dairies of size and scale, that's going to be a, a big management strategy that they're going to have to think about in terms of grouping cows, in terms of how close are they to the parlor. If you're running a rotary, do you need to slow it down because they're not going to load as fast as maybe those young two-year-olds are going to. In terms of transition and calving barns and, and how successful, uh, if, if, if you're a smaller dairy and, and the good news is for uh, where my cows live, my, my cattle partner milks 400 cows. He's exceptional in calving older cows. We've got a lot of older cows on the dairy. But that's a management strategy that, again, once you hit size and scale, is that really what you're, where you want to spend your time and efforts of calving those older cows that might need more, more time? The other management strategy, as we don't have as many replacements, and probably the incentive with black calves doesn't create the opportunity for that. One of the places where I think there can be some uh, captured efficiency or, or opportunity is in completion rates on heifers. And, and completion rates is simply, if you have 100 calves born, how many of them actually make the milking string? And I think we every calf counts. So I think at this point, uh, and, and you'll understand this a little better in a moment when I talk about calf wellness traits, because I think that is another management strategy that we need to look at. And then there's a ton of strategies out there in terms of the exact right amount of females each month, precision breeding strategies, that I said, calculators that are out there in the industry. I think the industry, interesting thing in the last 12 months is I hear far less or far less unanimity of why, what that number should be. Uh, Precision Dairy Conference was just in Illinois back last fall. There is a lot more variation and opinion of what that right number is. And, and I think that's good because I think it's very, very herd to herd specific. And I think uh, you can cut inventories too short and, uh, you know, it, it doesn't account for a black swan event. So having an insurance policy of having the right amount of heifers, I think, has uh, economic value to it for a producer. But I think that's the other management strategy that everybody's kind of struggling with right now is what is the right amount of heifers to have? And I think a lot of producers are, are working with that. I think in terms of the job that I do on a daily basis, we're really well prepared for these changes. As I said, we're always trying to escape where the puck is headed. That's the reason that we built that HHP index that I talked about uh, a moment ago. 
The other side in terms of sire development or, or in terms of the role that I play in, in procuring bulls for, for our company, continued emphasis on daughter fertility. And I put next to that, really, it's not just DPR anymore. I think it's more fertility index. It's DPR with in combined with heifer conception rate, cow conception rate. The combination of those three traits together, I think, is probably a, a better measure or a better indicator of, of daughter fertility. Uh, mastitis resistance um, is something that we've taken really, really seriously here for about seven years in our shop. And once we used to be that if you're making a decision on mastitis resistance, you look strictly at somatic cell score. Once in 2016, once Zoetis came in uh, with ZMAST, uh, we were able to use both of those measures. And, and since 2018, um, we have utilized all three of those. We designate bulls that are mastitis resistance pro that are exceptional in all three of those. But the, those have become a very, very big tiebreaker of those 7,500 bulls that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Whether you make the bus or you don't make the bus, you need to be probably really good in all three of those. You might get away with being good in two, but if you're bad in all three, it's, it's probably no go. The other piece that we're looking at for the future is some of the other things that maybe futuristically, I said we're talking about 2030 and beyond. I think the next little hanging fruit of keeping cows around and, and being healthy and, and productive lives is lameness. And so Zoetis lameness has become a very, very big tiebreaker for us. Um, again, if you know anything about Zoetis traits, 100 is breed average, and then 5, uh, 95 to 105 is one standard deviation, 90 to 110 is two standard deviations. Uh, if you're two standard deviations below, uh, again, that's that's sort of a red flag that maybe that's a bull that that may not make the bus unless he's exceptional in everything else. And as I talked about earlier of completion rates, calf wellness traits are really becoming a bigger target every day because those calves need to get off to the great starts. And, and genetic potential is there the day the calf is born or at conception. All we do is, is the environment reduces that. So we need calves or resistance to those, to those changes. So I'm going to fast forward another. I said I wrote those two articles in 2010 and they were published in 11. I did one last fall for Progressive Dairyman that talked about skating to the future and thinking to the horizon. And as I said a moment at the, at the beginning of this, I mean, genetics are moving at, at internal combustion engine speed versus where we were, you know, 15 years ago. But I think oftentimes we we get so worked up about the the immediate, the here, the now, the last herd check, the last sire summary. And when I looked at that mastitis resistance and, and I was thinking about cows that are going to be in our herds, our, our, our best cows, our long-lived cows, our longevity cows, when you think about when they're going to be created, it's to, to the calf that's conceived today that you inseminated this morning before this seminar is going to calve about New Year's Day of next year in 2025 meaning that she's probably going to enter the milking string sometime 2020, late 26, 27. And so by the time that she's in her sixth lactation, we're at 2022, 20, or 30, 2032, 2033. That's nine years from now. You know, and we don't sometimes think as long-term about that because we talk about what we like when they calve as two-year-olds. But these true superstars that are high longevity cows, they can, can make it to their fifth and their sixth lactation, we need to be thinking about those today because that's where we're headed. And not only that, I think when we think about genetic strategy, for lack of a better term, if we think to 2032, 2033 as dairy producers, what is your dairy going to look like in 10 years? Is it going to be larger? Are you, are you going to be making technological improvements, whether it's a rotary parlor or a robot? Are you going to be forced to be in the green energy movement and you're going to be doing some sort of digester or community digester, whatever that may be? Your bedding source may be different. So I always encourage people to think strategically to the future because I think it's inherently important to not think about the next herd check, but let's think about the next decade and what is our dairy going to look like? And I often tell people too, if you're not going to be in the dairy business in 10 years, Think about those who might want your cows or are going to buy your farm. What are they going to think about? What are, what's going to have value to you to that new potential person that's going to be milking those cows and what are they looking for? 
So this that was the impetus of this article that I did last fall. And, and you can see on the, the screen here, I'm just going to touch briefly why I'm so passionate or we talk so much about mastitis resistance. When you look at this by quartile and on the left hand side would be the best, lowest is best, highest is bad. There's such a linear correlation between the best and the worst when you do quartile analysis on dairies. And this was an example of, of uh, uh, CDCB mastitis. If you do it through zoetis and mastitis or somatic cell score, it's completely linear that these cows that are more naturally resistant to mastitis have fewer cases and they do better. And that's really what we're looking for is to be in a situation that we find this linear progression. And, and so that's a little bit of where my world has taken me there. And the other side, when we think about longevity, why are cows leaving the herd? And I think there's four really big reasons. Number one is still fertility. It's, as I said a few moments ago, we're light years ahead of where we were. When I started doing repro analysis work in 2004, 2005, the average preg rate in the U.S. was 14%. And now it's almost double that. I know of several herds that are achieving 40% preg rates, high 30s, and they're doing that with 100 pounds a day or producing seven or eight pounds of solids per cow per day, which was just unheard of in the mid 2000s. But we do need to continue to always have our eye on the prize in terms of we've made massive improvements in fertility, both genetically and technologically, but we can't take our eye off of that. The second one I truly believe is mastitis for all the reasons I've already mentioned. Different environments, cows living longer, all of those things are going to contribute and it is a massive profit robber and has the potential to be worse in the future because of these new environments cows are going to live in. The third one is production. Uh, the biggest thing I hear from producers every day uh, is three basic tenets, and that is pounds of milk per pound of dry matter, energy corrected milk, and pounds of solids per cow per day. And so those are metrics that everyone's looking at because it drives marginal milk and it cycles back to number one of fertility. Fertility may not be as important to making, creating replacements as it is driving days in milk, which drives this number three. And then lastly, lastly, the one that we haven't talked about yet today, but I think is somewhere out there and that's lameness. Um, I hear words, athleticism, free moving, those types of things. And so we're really looking to, that I think lameness and mobility are going to be important for a multitude of reasons, both profitability and the social license that we have in terms of those we work with are going to demand that they don't want to see cows that can't walk. And so we've, we're spending a lot of time on that. The good news is, and I'm going to focus just then on that for a few minutes. The good news is the CDCB, the Council of Dairy Cattle Breeding, has been doing a bunch of research on a genetic evaluation for hood hoof health. Been doing the research for a couple of years. Kristen Gaddis there at CDCB has been working on this data. Not sure how close we are to getting an evaluation for it, but the good news is, is we're going down that road. The current evaluation we have for lameness, again, is from our friends at Zoetis, and they've been great collaborators. I'll be the first to tell you that when this trait was introduced a few years ago, I was skeptical because of the fact that I spent so much time on dairies and with dairy farmers data to know that this was a really noisy piece of information out on dairies. But I have to give Zoetis a tremendous amount of credit in this regard because their data scientists are really good at, at washing data, standardizing data, getting it. And so now I think that this is probably the premier uh, evaluation. If you want cows that are freer moving, healthier, and, and more athletic, I think it's the best measure that we have out there. And I know we've had foot and leg measures forever. And I asked the question, is foot and leg composite as important as we think? And I'm not here to bang, bang on our friends at Holstein USA. It's a very difficult tra trait to measure. It has the lowest heritability virtually of all the traits uh, confirmationally that we measure. But I found this slide to be very, very indicative. And that is the correlation between foot and leg traits and longevity. And this study was done on bulls with over 100 daughters for productive life and had zoetis laymans. This to me tells me that we've probably been down the wrong road for the last several years in terms of trying to use foot and leg composite as a measure of, of productive life for livability. Because every one of the traits we currently measure has a negative correlation to productive life. The only one that doesn't is what is layman's. And I think it takes some of the noise out. It takes some of those pieces in. Um, 
I think this is really indicative of where we think we need to move in terms of having cows that move more freely, cows that have less lame events. The other side that we as an industry have taken a lot of heat on this over the last several years, and that's legs are too straight. Here it saw it. We still spent a lot of time out in barn seeing cows. Our team was talking about this probably by about 2013, 14. We're already seeing it and, and saw it in some of the donors we use, some of the bulls that were out there in the industry. The legs were definitely getting straighter and being incentivized to be that because the foot and leg composite, quite frankly, incentivized cows with a straighter leg. Well, by 2000, this is a, so we've had a problem that cows are getting too straight. Um, most folks would prefer to have cows with more intermediate. This slide proves that if we go after something, we can achieve it. So this is the average leg rear view, and this is a little dated. This goes back to 2022. The trend line continues that by birth year of the bulls that we're bringing into our shop, anyhow, you can see in 2016, they were definitely on the straight side. We improved dramatically, and now for the last three years, the average leg side view on the bulls that we bring in is, is on the positive side of zero. So the more to the set side than the straight side. And so I think we are making tremendous progress in those. I see it in young cows. But again, that long-term piece that I talked about of thinking to the heifer that you breed, the cow you breed today, that she's going to be a mature cow in 20, 2032, 2033. We still have a lot of cows that are in our facilities now that were conceived in 2014, 15, 16, where that was there, but I definitely know that we're making progress and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that. So in as we kind of wrap up here and then I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have, where are we going next? And I think one of them I've touched on in the moment was with hoof health evaluations. I think that that is uh, the next frontier and I think uh, rightfully so. And I look forward to seeing what research that uh, the council can come up with that and using foot trimmer data and some of that information that they're trying to compile. Milking speed probably should have been addressed a long time ago, uh, but they, it is on CDCB's radar screen. And I think as we, it often gets construed as something that the robotic producers want. It's not just robotic producers. We all want cows that are, are good on milking speed. And I think it has a lot of, applicability to any size shape uh, we need to know which are the best and which are the worst and and so hopefully we can get to a point where we can have a uh, better and and, and and a very accurate uh, milking speed evaluation I think there's some real interesting work going on in more robust feed efficiency obviously uh, we had to start somewhere and the five university trial got us on the path uh, I think there's far more to be seen yet in terms of feed conversion uh, and feed efficiency and pounds of milk per pound of dry matter, all these metrics that everyone's talking about. I think uh, I'm excited to see what may come in the next 10 years. And then lastly, methane emissions, um, whether we like it or not, it's here. Uh, the Canadians are already starting to do some work on this. I know there's other uh, university trials going on in terms of how do we find cows that maybe are, are better in that respect. But I do think it's probably an evaluation that comes in the next decade, I think we'll probably be like these health evaluations that we talked about that came in, in the last decade. So in conclusion, I just had a few take home messages that I wanted to give you. And that is, is that precision genetic management has never been more important on a dairy farm. Finding the right replacements in every heifer counts and, and utilizing all the tools available to you to do that. Because the population in my mind is not moving back to where it was. Uh, it may move slightly, but there's probably not a day where 3 million heifers are going to cab again in any given year for all the pressures on, on a multitude of levels. I also, as I said earlier, I'm agnostic. Uh, it's not my role to tell anyone how to breed their herd of cows. It's my role to make what the market is demanding. And that's how I approach my day every day in sire development. It is not my place to tell anyone how to do that. But select for those traits that have the, the true importance to your operation. And, and again, I'm not in a position to tell anybody that situation. As I said in that article that I did last fall, I think thinking longer term in terms of genetic selection is a good strategy. Let's think longer term. If we're going to make cows that are longer living and, and, and are more productive and healthy, uh, we need to be thinking more on a 10-year horizon than the last 21 days or the next 
until uh, the nine months till the calf is born. We need to think a little bit longer in terms of that. And then the last thing I'll tell you is the rate of change, I can rest assured uh, through the last decade of my career will continue to accelerate. Uh, it's going to move much faster than it, than it did. Uh, it's Moore's Law, and, and we're just seeing with the, the influx of data and information that we have at our fingertips, uh, the rate of change will continue to accelerate. So um, I guess my last parting shot, Amber, before we start is in the words of Yogi Berra, when you get to the fork in the road, take it. But I think there's a lot of different paths for folks to go down. Uh, and, and so that's truly what I wanted to, to share for a few minutes. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Super. That was that was wonderful. If anyone has any questions, you can pop them right into the chat and we will address them. Um, Kevin, I really it made me brought me a lot of joy when you um, mentioned that folks need to be prepared to have uh, geriatric wards on their dairies. I think like every farm we go out on, if you talk to them about what they're breeding for, oftentimes it's components, but a lot of times it's longevity and nobody ever is talking about how they're gonna take care of those old cows. Um, and it made me um, wonder, and perhaps you have some thoughts on this, if there are other parts of our industry, whether it be nutritionists or veterinarians or service providers who are prepared for these older cows too. Um, because I think it's gonna be, it's gonna take a team effort, not just a geriatric ward, but a team effort to keep these girls going this I long. Do you have any thoughts? I couldn't agree more. And I think that's why I'm kind of posing the question to the collaborators that I work with, our nutritionists. Uh, we talk about it uh, at MVD all the time. I mean, we we do have a geriatric ward. Our our old cow pen, uh, my partner Mitch is, is, is uh, aver the average in the mature cow pen is 4.7 lactations. And there are a ton of eighth, ninth lactation cows in that pen. And so when we think about you know, the ability to keep that group of cows healthy, producing, you know, they they cannot be in a stocking density uh, that maybe the younger cows can be. And so that, you know, stocking density considerations, I think, have to be put into, into place. Um, diets, you know, those, those cows have an ability to make a lot of product. Um, you know, that, that pen average is 136 to 138 pounds a day uh, because they're, they've proven that they can do it. But they, it takes a different methodology, foot trimmers, uh, dry cow facilities. And, and so I do think it, it's a collaborative effort. And I think that, you know, our, our friends in the pharmaceutical industry in terms of the right uh, treatment options, uh, in terms of uh, the entire industry, cow comfort, uh, it is, is going to be key. And then it's a matter of, uh, and I pose that question the way I did, because I think all of us want longer living cows. There's no doubt they are the most, the marginal milk, you know, it takes till well into their second lactation to pay back their raising costs, which is why we're making fewer of them. Uh, the part of it though, too, is, is it herds of size and scale. And I think that's where it, this discussion, what I have in the West is different than the Midwest or the Northeast or, or the herd sizes. Uh, and I think that's where um, for those herds that are, you know, mega or thousands of cows, then it becomes a little bit more of a philosophical argument of how long is long. And the other side of it is, as I said earlier about call rates and, and heifer populations and that stuff, um, you know, there's more question or there's less unanimity of that what that number should be uh if you talk to dr dr eicher at valley ag he's going to give you a different answer than maybe dr overton does at, at zuetis or albert devries has done such great work on mark on net present value and his economic calculation says maybe after five years of productive life uh so seven years old that we're losing genetic opportunity by having them live longer. So I think this becomes a very unique situation to each producer of how they view uh, what the right amount is and how old is old. But obviously we need to add life to uh, and, uh, and quality of life. It isn't just having old cows. It's having productive, healthy, athletic, older cows. Uh, maybe that's 
taking the, and realistically, where we sit in heifer populations right now, that supports about a 27, 28% call rate. Nationally, we are not at that number. So cows are gonna have to live longer. Is that a full lactation longer? So instead of 2.6 lactations, it's 3.6, 3.8. Um, each producer is probably gonna find that, that happy medium. And I don't know if that's the right answer to give you, Amber, but it's how I've thought about it. Sure. I think it was it was super interesting that you also spoke to how um, we're maybe or look, looking to breed for a smaller, mature animal. And uh, that really is aligned with um, how you were proposing to think about breeding cows, because the old cows that we have now that were you know, brought into the world 10 years ago, eight or 10 years ago, are huge. And I think that's a big part of why they're leaving the herd is because they are just such a large animal that they can't function in the barns that we have for them. So it'll be interesting to see how mature animal size decreases while longevity increases, perhaps. Great point, Amber. And I'm going to state for the record that I am not an anti-staturite. I am also agnostic to cow sons. I think that is a <laughs> a personal decision based on a multitude of factors. Number one, is it an ag engineering situation? And in a lot of situations it is. And once that facility is built, we need to find the right size cow for that facility. Um, the other side of it is, is that, you know, we probably have, like everything in life, we probably go too far on certain things and cows have gotten taller than they need to be. I think I continue to hear that people want them to be not as tall, but they want the strength and width and capacity. And I hear that from our nutritionist as well, is that he he wants a cow that, in, again, this is maybe Midwest focused, but you know we've got, and I think it's the same in the Northeast and in Vermont. I mean, we have the ability to feed our cows a lot of forage. And so a cow that can eat a lot of forage in a high forage diet needs to have the capacity to eat that much. Um, that pen of cows that I referred to, I mean, you know, they border on 68 to 70 pounds of dry matter per day to make 135 pounds a day. Uh, most of those are not itty, itty bitty small cows, but it, I do believe that I would not demean anybody that wants small cows. I know there's others that the bigger, the better. Uh, I'm agnostic to it. I'm not an anti uh, I And that's where when I said about more robust feed efficiency data, uh, I think there's going to be some really interesting research in the, in the coming decade that paints them with maybe a less broad brush that big is bad and little is good. I think there are big efficient cows. I think there are little inefficient cows. And I think some of the research data that, that could come out in the next decade will probably uh, confirm that it, is that, you know, we can, and, and, like most things in life, whether it's right, moderation is key. And that's probably where we need to live is somewhere in that moderated uh, spot where we've got cows that are uh, big enough to su support high production levels, but small enough to not eat up, yeah, undue maintenance requirements just to be going through their daily routine. Sure. Um, I don't again, see any I'll, I'll just state for the record, that's that's my personal opinion on, on cow size. I would not say that I, I, we have unanimity of opinion within our shop either. That's perfect. That's what we're here for. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I still have questions. Okay. <laughs> um, can you speak for a second um, about the, the difference in using productive life versus the livability value on a sire page when you're looking at Longe like breeding for longevity, um, maybe like what goes into that livability value? I know it's a fairly new index. It, it is, and it, it's sort of the inverse of, of uh, productive life. So livability tells you how long they, so what you want is probably productive life measures how long they live. So they live a good life or a bad life, it doesn't really say. Livability um, has to do with uh, the residual cull value and some of the pieces that you get. So you, you want a cow that when she leaves, she leaves on a truck, not in a compost pile. And so that's a little bit of what livability adds into is that they, it uses some of the, 
the, the residual coal value of that cow to get her uh, to pay back that economic piece of it versus um, productive life just says how long they live. It doesn't say whether they left on the truck or they, or they, they, they died. And so both of them probably have some, I look at both of them and I think there's, there's some variation to certain bulls that, um, you know, they live productive lives and then they die. And there's others that don't live as long, but they get to go on the truck. And, and so they still gave you something before they left. So I think in terms of longevity, uh, we probably still look at productive life more than we do livability. Um, but we also know that within productive life, um, you know, that encounters all of these fitness and health, health traits that we've talked about. But I do think that we've spent more time of recent spending time on particularly mastitis resistance. I just think that, you know, that is a piece that uh, uh, as we change these environments of where cows are going to live, and if we want them to live longer, more productive lives, um, an old cow is going to have a higher likelihood of, of having a mastitis event than young cows. And so I speak so passionately about mastitis resistance because any quartile analysis that you do, uh, best to worst, I mean, it, it, it has as much Red Sea parting as any of the other, um, you know, quartile analysis that can be done. And I think it's, it's, it's the low hanging fruit that, that if we want cows to, especially again, environmentally, as cows, more cows live not on sand and they're going to live on, on uh, manure solids, uh, that is going to do as much to add productive life as anything. What do you think the, well, or do you know what the heritability of those mastitis resistance traits really are compared to the bigger picture of management? It's just a small piece of the pie or is it a pretty big piece of the pie? Um, I think, and, and great question, and I'm going to say that I don't have the exact heritability. Uh, I'd have to look it up. It's probably out at CDCB somewhere. What I do know is that the combination of looking at all three of them, we think is more powerful than looking at one of them by themselves. So as I mentioned earlier, certain bulls will designate as mastitis resistant pro bulls. They are bulls that have exceptional values in, in all three of those mastitis traits. So the power of the three together, I think is, is, is at its best. Uh, same way that I spoke of fertility values of so using fertility index more so than DPR. Um, I think DPR has gotten a little noisy in and of itself of single trait selecting for DPR um, because of activity systems, beef semen, embryos. There's just a lot more noise that is out there that, that I tend to look more at fertility index. And we as a team look at fertility index more than we did say three years ago. That, that doesn't mean that we don't care about DPR, we do. But I think the collective, a uh, lot of the three traits together is more powerful than, than one alone. It's good to know, I'm a big DPR fan. <laughs> um, all right, last question and then I'll let you go. Sure. Um, you mentioned that the technology or early on, you were talking about the technology for sorted semen and how it has changed and kind of evolved since those early days. Um, and I, so I was wondering if the conception rate on using sorted semen has changed since it was first introduced just due to like how that whole processing system works. Is it comparable to conventional semen conception rates these days, or is there still, is that stigma still out there and, and like a, a viable stigma? <laughs> I think it, it, great question, Amber. And I think all of the above, yes. Um, the efficiency of the machines in terms of being able to take. So if I use an example in 2003, four, when we start, first started sorting product, a collection that would have produced in, in hypothetically, a collection that would have produced a hundred units of traditional process semen would make 20 units of sorted product. We are now to the point where the efficiency is so good that those machines can produce 102 units for every 100 units of conventional semen that would have been produced by the same ejaculate. So there's a massive 
you know, technological advances and just looking at the machines and the, and the, the you know, the, the advance in technology. Along with that, because the technology has gotten better, I think fertility is far, far closer to conventional semen than it was uh, even a decade ago. Um, what we are seeing through a lot of producers within this pre precision breeding strategy is there is far, far more sex semen going into lactating cows uh, than we saw just a few years ago. Uh, I just had a conversation with a producer this week who melts 4,000 cows and he wants to, uh, he's using embryos primarily because it's a genetic development herd in his first and second lactation cows. And he's thinking of breeding his third and over one unit sexed one unit conventional and then going to black and uh and he's confident that he thinks he can make an you know that it can can fit into his management strategy and i don't think five years ago anybody would say yeah i'm going to bring my third lactation wow. cows to to sort of semen so it has become you know far closer now that doesn't mean that it's the exact same and this goes because of more sort of semen going into lactating cows that is part of the reason that I, I said I think DPR is a little noisy because it's not as standardized as it was, you know, a few years ago. But that being said, I think people can be far, far more confident mm -hmm. using the sort of product uh, on lactating cows than, than and, and, and it's better in heifers too. I mean, it's just the technology continues to improve. And I know that there's probably more iterations of, of that technology that will come that will will get it to, to fruition. And, and I know for a lot of very, very large dairies, uh, they live in a sex and beef world. That is the only product that they are using. Um, doesn't mean that there, it's a sin to use conventional semen. I'll, I'll just make this plug because I say it all the time. There are heifer calves in conventional semen too. Just in case anybody was having questions about that, you know, fifty percent of them are females, and uh, and and we also you know see the the posts of uh, the occasional, and we've had them ourselves, the the bull calf that came from sex semen as well, because it's not a hundred percent. I mean, it it just it, it's much better, but it it's it's exciting technology, and and like I say, I, that's the amazing part to me was you know being part of that early on that it was just the bulls that made enough semen that we could sort. You know, wasn't that yeah. if bull was in an extremely high demand, he didn't go to the sorters because um, we would never be able to keep up with supply and demand to the point now that uh, the very, very best bulls in the industry are produced. Uh, you know, there's the rare occurrence of a bull that doesn't sort, but there's not many of them anymore. And so the expectation of our customer base and producers is that if they want to use a bull, they're expecting that that we have sort of product on. And I think that's that's part of this meteoric rise of of genetic levels within dairy cattle is just it's the all of the above. Well, this is just so exciting. I could talk to you about it all day, but um, I will let you go. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and, and all the work that you've done in this industry. Um, My pleasure. Great to visit with you guys today and, and uh, wish you all the best of success. Hope you have a marvelous spring. Hope you all get some moisture out there too, because we need it here as well. But uh, appreciate the time today and, and glad to be with you. Thanks, Kevin. Have a great day. Thank you.